Welcome back to Hover Unbox. Today we're checking out Warhammer Vermintide 2, or more specifically, we're looking at the kind of performance you can expect to see using a wide range of GPUs. And if our latest poll is anything to go by, it seems like it's a game you guys really want us to check out. Before we get into the benchmark results though, today's video has been sponsored by Corsair and their impressive new range of Hydro Series all-in-one liquid coolers. The new Pro models are available with either a 280mm or 360mm radiator and both deliver exceptional performance with an almost silent operating volume. For more information, please check the link in the video description. For those of you unaware, Vermintide 2 was released a few weeks ago by developer slash publisher Fat Shark on March 8th, and it's a follow-up to 2015's Warhammer N Times Vermintide. The game wasn't really on our benchmark radar, so we just skipped it. But last Friday, I decided to pick it up on Steam and add it to the games that we're currently benchmarking GPUs with in 2018. After giving it a quick go on Friday, I was super impressed with how well it played and how great it looked. The game's built upon the Autodesk Stingray engine, previously known as the BitSquid engine. The developer says that they have been constantly updating the game engine since the release of the first Vermintide title, and this has enabled them to deliver better optimization, improving how they utilize both the CPU and GPU. We often hear about how a developer is focused on optimization for the PC, and then the game turns out like a bit of a PUBG. This though isn't the case with Vermintide 2, the optimization here really is next level. They've also added support for DirectX 12, and we'll discuss which API you should use later in the video. Other new features and enhancements include volumetric lighting and fog, which provides a lot of depth to the environments. Texture streaming provides superior texture handling with greater detail and a new fluid system that enables liquids to spread naturally over the environments, and the developers harness this to create some amazing looking napalm-like effects. The game has been designed to take advantage of core heavy CPUs, and things like animations, particle effects, culling and physics are all spread across as many cores as possible. As you'd expect, DirectX 12 support also improves draw call overhead and further improves CPU utilization. For now though, I'm focusing on the GPU performance, but we'll certainly cover the CPU side of things in a future video, and likely add this title to our arsenal of games that we use to test the latest and greatest CPUs. For testing Vermintide 2, I've decided to use the Keep Hub. There's no combat here, but the GPU performance is similar to that of the missions. It's also the same as the Prologue, it just doesn't take two minutes to get into. So for benchmark marking a truly massive amount of graphics cards, the key pub just makes the most sense. The pass lasts for 60 seconds and I'm reporting the 1% low and average frame rates from an average of three runs. Most of the testing will be done using the extreme quality preset, but I've also got some medium quality results with some older graphics cards as well. As always, the latest AMD and NVIDIA display drivers available at the time of testing have been used and the game version used for testing was 1.0.4.1. Additionally, all graphics cards were tested in our Corsair GPU test rig, and inside we have a Core i7 8700K clocked at 5GHz with 32GB of Vengeance DDR4-3200 memory. This allows us to minimise system bottlenecks and show you the true performance of each GPU. Also, please note all testing has been conducted using the DirectX 11 API, and before the AMD fans turn red with low-level rage, just hear me out. Those with a GeForce GPU will see a 5-10% to performance uplift when using DirectX 11 in favour of DirectX 12. There's probably not too many surprises there. Now, I was expecting to test the Radeon GPUs using DirectX 12, but as it turns out, this actually puts AMD at a bit of a disadvantage. Using the Core i7 test rig, which isn't CPU bound, the Radeon GPUs suffered up to a 15% reduction in frame time performance when using DirectX 12 instead of DirectX 11. Although the average frame rate was much the same, the weaker 1% lower results looked pretty bad, so I opted to use DirectX 11 instead. Now, if you have a lower end CPU, then DirectX 12 might help improve performance, but when not restricted by the CPU, DirectX 11 looks like the way to go for this title. Right, now that I've clearly explained the situation, I expect we'll see no irate comments about using Radeon GPUs with DirectX 11. Now that it's safe to proceed, let's get into the benchmark results. As we often do, let's start with the previous generation GPUs, but please note, as usual, we're skipping the RX 400 range because the RX 500 series is just the same deal with some factory overclocking. So let's not waste any time testing the fourth generation GCN parts twice. 
Here we see some very promising performance at 1080p using the maximum in-game quality settings. The GTX 960 and R9 380 were able to deliver playable performance with over 30 FPS at all times in our test. Ideally though, for these quality settings, gamers will want a GTX 970 or R9 390, and both did push over 60 FPS for the most part. Then, as we increase the resolution to 1440p, the R9 380 and GTX 960 fall into unplayable territory, as you'd probably expect. Still, the R9 390 and GTX 970 provided a decent experience, but the game was noticeably more responsive with the GTX 980 and R9 390X. Meanwhile, the GTX 980 Ti beat the Fury X quite easily, and we've pretty much come to expect that. It is the king of the previous generation GPUs after all. As good as Vermintide 2's optimization is, you're not going to be able to play using the maximum quality settings at 4K. That said, the performance with the GTX 980 Ti was impressive, and with a few tweaks to the quality settings, it shouldn't be that hard to achieve playable performance. Now, let's move on to the current generation GPUs, and here we see games need only a GTX 1050 Ti, though it has to be said the RX 570 proved to be a significantly better choice in this title, delivering a whopping 40% more frames. The GTX 1060 and RX 580 were neck and neck, though it was interesting to see Vega 56 pulling ahead of the GTX 1070, and wasn't that far behind the 1070 Ti. The air-cooled Vega 64 GPU did struggle against the GTX 1080, and it took the expensive liquid-cooled model to take the lead. Bumping the resolution up to 1440p saw surprisingly good performance from the GTX 1060 and RX 580. For silky smooth performance though, with no input lag, the GTX 1070 or Vega 56 will be required. Then we see Vega 64 neck and neck with the 1070 Ti, while the liquid cooled version was able to match the GTX 1080. Then as expected, the Pascal Titan X and GTX 1080 Ti destroyed everything else with well over 100 FPS on average. Moving to 4K, the experience with the 1080 Ti was very nice. You could only just tell that it was dropping below 60 FPS at times, but it was still a very smooth and playable experience. Even the 1070 and Vega 56 were playable, though you will want to tweak the quality settings a little bit to bump those frame rates up. Now, just quickly, here's all 33 current and previous generation GPUs at 1080p crammed into a single graph. As you can see, for the most part, we were able to keep the frame rates above 40 FPS at all times, which is impressive given the visual quality. Five GPUs were dropped from the 1440p testing as they were way too slow, but you could also cut out anything under the R9 380X. The GTX 1060, RX 580, GTX 980, and R9 390X are the bare minimum you can get away with when using the extreme quality preset at 1440p. Then at 4K, just 18 current and previous generation GPUs were tested, but even then you could drop half of the cards I did test. Anyway, not much more really can or I suppose needs to be said here, so let's move on to check out some of the old bangers. Digging into the bargain bin, we find some real gems for playing Vermintide 2 at 1080p with modest quality settings. Here the GTX 650 Ti was able to deliver playable performance while the Radeon R7 260X was actually quite good, as was the GTX 750 Ti. Beyond that, we're pushing over 60 FPS on average, so the experience was great on the R7 370 and GTX 660 Ti for example. For a minimum of 60 FPS, you'll only require the Radeon HD 7950, though from Nvidia, the GTX 680 is needed. Still, for a game that looks very visually impressive, Vermintide 2 has proven to be very hardware friendly. Overall, Warhammer Vermintide 2 looks to be a great quality game. Visually, it's very impressive, and best of all, it's actually optimized on the PC. With a mid-range graphics card, you really can enjoy it with all the eye candy turned up, and this is one of the few AAA titles we've tested to date that plays perfectly at 4K with a single high-end GPU graphics card. I also really appreciate the fact that it works well on both AMD and Nvidia hardware. The fact that there's no developer bias going on here is likely a big part of why the game is actually well optimised. In the near future, I'm very keen to explore CPU performance as well, and given what I saw with the Core i7-8700K, I expect this title will play very well on Ryzen systems, and this is something I will be investigating using both the DirectX 11 and DirectX 12 APIs. For now though, I'm going to end this one here. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe for more content. If you appreciate the work we do here at Harbour Unbox, then consider supporting us on our Patreon. You will gain access to our Discord chat and monthly live stream. Thanks for watching. I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time.